Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered, say the next two words, strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and say the next two words, they died before the Lord. All right, turn to Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16. So two sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, have offered up strange fire, fire that did not come from the altar. They started their own fire, and that was against God's commandment. And he has devoured them and killed them. Chapter 16, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he, say the next two words, die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat, and thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat. He shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and he shall be girded with the linen girdle, and with the linen mitre shall he be attired. That's like a turban, a uh, head covering piece. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering, and one for a ram offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is, say the next two words, for himself, and make an atonement, say them again, for himself. Y'all looking at Leviticus 16 and verse number 6. Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is, say it, for himself, and make an atonement, say it, for himself and for his house. Skip down to verse number 11. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is, say it, for himself, and he shall make an atonement, say it, for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. All right? And so God has slain Nadab and Abihu, and now comes to tell Aaron what to do so that he doesn't die. And, uh, and he has to get things right. He has to get right with God. And uh, I was going to call this message, Get Right With God or Die, uh, but I changed my mind because I wanted to be nicer on Wednesday night and try to encourage you a little bit. And so I want to preach on getting right with God tonight. Getting right with God. Pray with me and for me now. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the Word of God. I pray that you'll help us tonight. I pray that you'll open up this passage of Scripture. God, I pray that you will have me say the things you would say uh, if you were teaching a lesson from this chapter about getting right with God. Lord, I pray you help us to uh, arrest our minds now. Let us give you our attention. I pray you'll meet us here and feed the flock. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> the book of Leviticus, the third book of your Bible, uh, you know, uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. All, right? all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And, uh, and so all the Bible is wonderful. Somebody say amen. amen. And there are parts of the Bible that if you are an avid Bible reader, uh, or preacher or teacher, uh, there are parts of the Bible that are probably but more fond to you, parts that are maybe your favorite. Uh, portions of the Psalms are probably some of your favorite. Uh, certain books of the Bible. Uh, as a preacher, there are books of the Bible that I just, I just really enjoy preaching from. I thoroughly enjoy the Gospel of Mark, um, the Hammer. I love that Gospel. I love to preach from it. Uh, the book of Hebrews is one of the uh, richest books, I think, in the entire volume of Scripture. I love the book of Hebrews. And, uh, and, and if, a lot of times if someone said, what's your favorite book of the Bible? I mean, I've got a list of about, you know, about 57 books long of books that are my favorite book of the Bible. And, uh, but if I was to ask you what's your favorite book and you were to give me a list of maybe seven or eight books of the Bible, I highly doubt Leviticus would probably be on that list. I've, I've never heard anybody say Leviticus is my favorite book of the Bible. But I have often said, well, the preacher, I started reading my Bible through this year, but I really just, I really bogged down in Leviticus, got stuck in Leviticus. And, and look, I'll just be flat out honest with you. There are some uncomfortable things in Leviticus. 
There are some uh, things that are almost like, can God even talk about those things? I mean, when you get to Leviticus chapter 15 and it starts talking about all those issues and, and all that seed stuff, and it gets, a little, it gets a little strange. And the book of Leviticus is a very gory book, a very bloody book. Lots of animals dying and lots of lambs dying and lots of people dying. And, and uh, Leviticus is probably no one's favorite book, but Leviticus, if I've, come to, uh, if I've come to learn, is a wonderful book, and it's a great book, and believe it or not, some of you can maybe go back and reread it yourself and check it, uh, God speaks directly in Leviticus more than He does anywhere else in the, in the rest of the Bible. God is the direct speaker on almost every page of Leviticus, a lot of pages, 27 chapters, and uh, Leviticus is a wonderful book, it's a super deep, but it comes right after the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus is all about God getting Israel out of Egypt. And then Leviticus is all about God getting Egypt out of Israel. Leviticus or Exodus is, it means exit. It mean, that's what Exodus means. And, and so the Exodus is all about God's power getting them out of bondage and out of slavery. While the book of Leviticus is all about God's presence and getting them in the sanctuary. Leviticus, is, as it follows the book of Exodus, Exodus is how they get in. It's how God gets them out of Egypt and gets them into His congregation. Leviticus is God cleaning them out. Exodus, they get out. And Leviticus, they get cleaned out. And God starts to clean them out. If you can hold your place there in chapter 16 and look in chapter number 11. Chapter 11. Leviticus 11. While Exodus is all about the power of God, Le- Leviticus is all about the presence of God. It's all about the presence of God, and it's all about the propitiation of God. Over and over and over again, you've got lambs dying, you've got rams dying, you've got bullocks, you've got doves, you've got goats, you've got ewes, you've got uh, cattle, you've got all s- doves, you've got all sorts of things dying for the sins of the people of Israel. And Israel, them people, they were a, a, a people that were brought out of Egypt by blood, but they were also a people that were kept nigh to God by blood. And, uh, and I can bear witness with that because it was the blood of Christ that saved my soul and put me in the family of God. But I've got news for you. It's the blood of Christ that keeps me in the family of God. Uh, Exodus chapter, uh, excuse me, Leviticus chapter number 11. Look at the end in verse number 44. Leviticus 11 and verse 44. We've got the preference of God. He says, I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be what? Holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy... For I am holy. And he's about to change how they live. Turn over to uh, Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18. God has a preference. They're going to learn that he has more than just power. And he has more than just presence. But God has a preference for how his people are to live. Leviticus chapter 18 verse number 1. Say amen when you get there. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye... Say the next two words. Not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye say them, Not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Ye shall do my judgments, and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. And God brings the people of Israel out of Egypt, but not just for sake of taking them out and letting them go be Egypt somewhere else. He brings them out so they can live a different way. 
He brings them out so that they can be holy like he is holy. And he, very, he is very specific. He says, you're not going to live the way they did in Egypt, and you're going to go into Canaan land where they actually live even worse, and I don't want you living like them either. I want you living according to my statutes, my judgments, my commandments, my ordinances. If you're going to live with me, you're going to live my way. Somebody say amen. And can I say that, no, I'm not a Jew, but I am a child of God. And if God, when God saved me, he did not save me so I could live however I wanted to, so I could live like Egypt or live like this world. He saved me to be conformed to the image of his dear son, Romans 8, 29. We all love Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for good. We all love that verse, but that second verse, that next one, verse 29, says that the him he called, then he also did predestinate to be conformed into the image of his dear son. You say, what does that mean? That means if God saved you, he predestinated you, your destiny, your destiny, destination was already planned for you to become like Christ. That means he didn't save you so you could live like a sinner. He saved you so you could live like Jesus. Amen. Amen. God has a preference that his people be holy. And that is nowhere more clearly illustrated or proven than in the lives of Aaron and his sons. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, are slain by God a consuming fire because they didn't do it his way. They didn't do it his way. They did it their way. We live in a generation that's all about doing it their way. We live in a generation where good people are all about doing it their way when we're supposed to do it God's way. We're supposed to do it God's word's way. There's no new book. This is it. If you're dissatisfied with this one, tough apples, this is all we got. And and let me just say this, that's enough. I ain't never met a soul, and I know a lot of souls. I know a lot of good souls. I've never met a soul that's that's lived out this whole Bible. Never met a one. So we got enough to live through. We got enough to follow. We don't need a new book. And God gave us his commandment. He gave us his word. He gave us his statutes. He gave us his judgments. He gave us his ordinances to live by. And Nadab and Abihu failed to do so, and God killed them. And so in chapter 16, uh, the, uh, the, the dialogue picks back up, and God is telling Moses, tell Aaron to get this stuff right, to get himself right with me, so that he does not die. It was a very severe thing. It was not optional. I do want you to see that. It was not optional. God wanted him to get this thing right that he die not. All right? And I I know God doesn't smite us dead like he did in the Old Testament. But I will say this. He does remove his hand. And getting right with God is a serious thing. Getting right with God is an important thing. Let me say this. It's not optional. If we're going to belong to God... We're supposed to be right with God. And to belong to God and to not be right with God means to not be in communion with God. All right, so we're supposed to get right with God. And we have a perfect five-point lesson on how to get right with God in the life of Aaron in Leviticus chapter 16. How many of you are still with me? Say amen. Amen. All right, Leviticus 16 verse number 1. Leviticus 16, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered before the Lord and died. I want you to notice first Aaron's attention. Aaron's attention. In verse 1, he says, After the death of the two sons of Aaron, then God comes to speak to him. So Moses, uh, uh, Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, had been slain by none other than God himself. And then God comes to speak to Aaron to tell him how to get right with God. I'd say that God had had Aaron's attention, wouldn't you? I mean, all this is still fresh on his mind. His sons, the dirt still still damp from where they buried him just not long ago. Uh, I mean, the, the, the mound's still there. The grave's still fresh, and, and it's fresh on his mind. God has his attention. I'm going to make you a statement. I want you to write it down. God will often shake us before he speaks to us. God will often shake us before he speaks to us. Now God is a perfect gentleman. God is a perfect gentleman, but he's he's not mealy-mouthed, and he don't like being ignored. And so God will often shake us before he speaks to us. Things will come into our lives sometimes and almost always negatively 
to get our attention because positive things don't get our attention. Positive things don't shake us up. They just make us smile more. Positive things that come into our life just reinforce what we're already doing. I mean, if it's working. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? And so a lot of times God will shake us so that He can speak to us. I mean, don't for, I mean, and, and I don't want to speak too, too condemning of Aaron because, I mean, he did a lot more for God than I'll probably ever have the opportunity to do. It was Aaron's staff that parted the Red Sea. It was Aaron's staff that turned the, the water in the Nile River into blood. It was Aaron's staff that ate the serpents. It was Aaron's rod that budded in the Ark of the Covenant. Somebody say amen. Aaron, uh, he had his flaws like you and I, but Aaron did some great things for God. And I don't know what I was going to say. I got distracted by... All the good though. What was I saying, Brother Derek? Do you remember? He got his attention. That's right. God got Aaron's attention. Oh, that's what I was going to say. This is the same man that when Moses was gone for 40 days, he met a golden calf. All right, the image of the devil. All right, the book of Ezekiel. He made a golden calf. And said, Israel, these be thy gods that brought thee up out of Egypt. How foolish and how dumb to say. You literally, in chapter 15, are singing a song about all the things God did. Literally, you watch the Red Sea part and stand up. You watch that with your own eyes. Then you took off the gold from your own face and your own wrists and then made a calf and said, the calf done it. No common sense there nowhere. There's no, none of that. There's no logic. All right. But this is the same man that 40 days without Moses made a really foolish decision. What I'm trying to say is that we, in, in a comfortable spot when there's not a lot of adversity, sometimes it's hard for us to listen to God and do the right thing. And so God will allow trial or will allow sorrow or will allow uh, something to shake us so that He can speak to us just so that we will hear Him. Let he that hath an ear, let him hear. All right, so Aaron's attention, God gets his, God gets his attention. And uh, I wonder if God is trying to get anyone's attention. You say, preacher, I just don't know what's going on. It's like this messed up, that messed up, and seven different things have just fallen apart right off the bat. Maybe God's trying to say something to you. Maybe God's just trying to knock on your door and say, hey, i got to tell you something. Maybe he's trying to get your attention. All right, so Aaron's attention, verse 1. But look in verse number 2, we're going to see Aaron's approach. Aaron's approach in verse number 2. And the Lord said unto Moses, are y'all okay? Amen. The Lord spake unto Moses, speak, speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. All right, many of you have been around the Bible for a long time and understand how the tabernacle was laid out. But you had an outer court, you had a yard that was fenced in. All right, that's animals, things, people be in there all the time. Then there was the actual tabernacle, the tent building. And then you come in and it was in rooms. And you come in, there's the table of showbread, the candlestick, the laver where Aaron would go and look in the mirror and wash his hands and wash his face and wash with water to cleanse himself. There was a veil. All right, this is, that veil is very significant, very important. And on the other side of that veil was the holy place. All right, the holy place was where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the mercy seat was. That is where God would manifest himself via this cloud. How many of you are with me? Say amen. amen. All right, and so this, that's where the blood had to go. All right, the blood had to go in there and be placed on that mercy seat on the Day of Atonement. That's where the blood had to go. All right, that's where Moses, that's where Nadab and Abihu, they're out there around with strange fire, and they're taking it in places that don't belong, and so God, God consumes them. And so he tells Aaron, he says, don't come in here all the time. You can't just come in here all times. You only come when that cloud's on there. All right, look at, look at in verse 2 again. He says that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark. So we know exactly where he's telling Aaron, you can't go all the time. He's going behind the veil where the ark is, where the mercy seat is. He says, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. 
And he says, you've got to make an adjustment to your approach. You can't just barge in here willy-nilly whenever you feel like it. You can only come when my cloud's on there. When I'm there, that's when you can come. Well, all of you are welcome in my house when I'm home. But if I come home from being out of town or come home from somewhere and you're in my living room, when I'm not there, I'm going to be a little bit upset about that. And I'm going to wonder, who let you in? Did you break in? Did you, did you make a copy of my keys? How did you get in? You don't have authority to come in here. Your approach is wrong. You can come knock on my door and come in and have a cup of coffee. Y'all know I love to drink coffee. Y'all can come over any time. But you can't come in there when I'm not home. And he told Aaron, he said, you can't just come in here when I'm not here. And I know in the New Testament it does say we can come boldly into the throne room of God to, uh, and get mercy and find help in our time of need. And you can enter into God's throne room boldly, but you better come in humbly. You better not come in like you own the place and start walking around. Your approach better be a humble and a reverent reproach. We, we need to understand and always remember in getting right with God that God is in charge of everything, even our prayer life. When you're praying, you're not in charge. Sir, when you're on your knees praying, your voice is not the most important one. Your mind's not the most important one. When you're praying, when you're trying to get right with God, if in your heart's mind God's not in charge, then your approach is wrong. Our approach has to be adjusted. And that's what he told Aaron. He said, you can't come in here all the time. You come when that cloud's there. You come when I'm home. That's my spot. That's my place. That's my mercy seat. That's my ark. This is mine. You don't just barge in there. And I think a lot of times we have this, we have this very southern mentality that, man, we will, we're probably going to mess up on Friday night. We're probably going to make a bad decision at the restaurant. We're probably going to make a bad decision Saturday night and do some silly stuff. But we're going to come to church on Sunday, and we're going to march ourselves down that altar and ask God to forgive us again, and everything's going to be all right. I got news for you, friend. That's not how this thing works. I know that's what the South created. I know that's what the country music songs created. And that may make them feel warm and fuzzy, but it ain't doing a blessed fire thing for God. We better adjust our approach. I got news for you. Listen, churches all over the South are filled to the brim and the South's more wicked today than it's ever been. We've, I know this is the buckle of the Bible Belt, but we've got more demons floating around the southeast than we ever have in the history of the southeast. And I think a lot of that has to do with our approach. We think we can just walk on God and come in whenever we want to. That's not how this thing works. I know this is the Wednesday night crowd, and you might be thinking, why are you preaching that to us? Because it's the Wednesday night crowd that developed this mentality. Because we're faithful to church. We're here all the time. We all tithe. If you tithe, raise your hand. If you tithe, raise your hand. Now, this honest session right here. If you tithe, raise your hand. 10% of your income, you give that to God. That's obedience to His Word. I mean, this is the core. I mean, well, this is the Joseph crowd. If first something gets done, we're the, doer, we're the doer of it, right? A lot of times that goes to our head because we are finite men. We are finite creatures. And we start looking at all the things we do for God. Like Aaron. Look, no one outranked Aaron. He's the high priest. I mean, Moses outranked him, but he's the high priest. All right, when someone sinned, they came to Aaron to get that thing took care of. You reckon that ever went to his head? You reckon that affected his, uh, his time with God? Y'all, in your mind right now, get somebody that just, they're so arrogant, it comes out and just how they talk to people and how they talk to you, and you can't even have a conversation without their pride and arrogance just coming out. Is that person in your head right now? All right, how do you think that is when they're praying? You think it comes out when they're praying? If they cannot have a five-minute conversation with you about work, food, football, politics, or church, or family... Do you think that arrogance comes out when they're talking to God? We need to adjust our approach. We don't set the terms. We don't set the time when we get right with God. We're not in charge. We are not God. Aaron was not God. He was God's priest, but he wasn't God. All right, you all looking at me kind of strange.
Brother William, what's the verse in James? God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace unto the humble. You know where your pride's going to show up the fastest? In your prayer life. Well, this point's got a lot bigger than I thought it was going to. All right. You say, I don't know. I'm not, not me. I'm not a prideful prayer. All right. How much time do you spend praying about the sins of others versus the sins of your own? How much blame do you accept for the condition of our city versus how much blame do you put on the mother folks? How much blame do you put on yourself while we haven't been in revival in, what, 200 years, 150 years? How long have been since we had a revival in, the, in our area? How much blame do you put on yourself versus how much blame do you put on contemporary social media, the news, the left? Another nation from the other side of the border? You see, your arrogance is going to show up in your prayer life, and God resisteth the proud. I wonder, I wonder how many prayers we, we have prayed that have flat out got on God's nerves. Because our approach ain't right. How many prayers have we prayed that have got on God's nerves? Because it's so prideful, so self-absorbed. So pharisaical. You say, oh, I'm not a Pharisee. I'd let God answer that instead of yourself. We've got to adjust our approach. All right, let me move on. So I know y'all love that one so much. Let's, let's go. God help us. Let's go to this next one. Are y'all still in Leviticus 16? You didn't unclose your Bible, did you? All right. Who this one ain't no better. Mm. Verse 3, verse 3. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a what? Sin offering. And a ram for a what? A burnt offering. This is his atonement. All right, so what we got to do is Aaron's got to get his sin atoned for. He's got to get his sin forgiven before he can go and atone for the sins of the nation. Does that make sense? Before... Be, be, before he can ask God and bring in blood for the other people, he's got to bring in blood for himself, all right? So his atonement, and it just so happens to be that the atonement for the high priest is the same atonement for the rest of the nation. It's a sin offering. It's a bullock. It's a ram. He has to make the same kind of offering that the, the high priest of Israel I mean, the most spiritual person under Moses in all the land. That guy has to make the same sacrifice. His sin has the same price tag as the worst offender in Israel. His sin, as small as they may be. I mean, you got to know Aaron probably never went and had adultery. He probably never went and stole something. Aaron probably never one time went and killed somebody or went and robbed somebody or went and maligned somebody or, or, or did anything like that. His sin was probably one of them small sins, one of those maybe just sins of the mind, one of those sins that probably nobody else but him and God even know about anyway. Yet his sin, his sin required the same sacrifice as the worst sins of anyone else in Israel. Because it, doesn't, it does not matter. It doesn't matter if you're the pastor or the guy that only comes once a month. We got to get our sins forgiven the exact same way. And Aaron had to make an atonement for his own sin. And you got to put yourself in Aaron's shoes. I mean, he's making atonement for people that do crazy, stupid things. I mean, read the list in Leviticus. Go read those lists. They're horrible. He deals with laziness. He deals with lawfulness. He deals with lust. I'm talking about people having relationships with their own flesh and blood, their mother taking their daddy's wife, taking their, their brother's wife. I mean, all sorts of crazy nonsense is going on and that God's cleaning out of Israel and Aaron's making sacrifices for some of the dumbest, most 
wicked, most spoiled people he's ever seen in his life. And the sacrifice he makes for them, he's got to make for himself over a sin so much smaller. You see, the problem is our sins get dangerously small the more we grow. That's the problem, Brother Stephen. Our sins get so small that in our eyes they're not really even a big deal anymore. I mean, compared to old so-and-so that's, I mean, he can't stay out of his so-and-so's bed or he can't get off the bottle or he can't get off dope or he can't get off this or, or she can't quit doing that. And we look at ourselves and think, man, sure I'm glad God don't have to put up with that for me. Sounds an awful lot like that Pharisee that prayed in the Gospel of Luke that said, I'm so glad I'm not like this publican. Makes God want to throw up. Aaron had to make the same sacrifice for himself than he did for the others. All right, next. See if this gets any better. Verse 4. He shall put on the holy linen coat. He shall have the linen breeches. Upon, oh, this gets worse. I'm sorry. <laughs> he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and he shall be girded with the linen girdle, and with the linen mitre shall he be attired. So we see Aaron's attire. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and shall put them on. He had to, he had to change his clothes to go get right with God. Uh, he had to put on some holy garments. He had to put on his holy priestly garments. Everybody didn't have that. That was something that God had Moses had made just for Aaron to put on. There's linen garments. The, the, the linen breeches. I mean, it almost, it almost kind of sounds like underwear. It was what would go up under all the fancy stuff. He had a bunch of fancies. He had a crown. He had an ephod. He had a breastplate. He had all sorts of fancy things, the blue and all that stuff that he wore, bells, and I mean, he had all, he had the garb on. And if you looked at Aaron, you think, good, not that sharp, that's fancy. That's not what he had to put on to go get right with God. He had to put on just the linens. From the, some of his head, it had that mitre, that head covering all the way down to his feet. It had to be covered in holy humility. It wasn't fancy. It wasn't ornate. It wasn't decorative. It was just plain. But he had to change his clothes. Y'all ever go to Walmart and make fun of folks because they're wearing bunny slippers and pajama pants and a hood 17 sizes too big and the hair was all crazy and it looked like it had been washed? Y'all ever see, y'all ever see Walmart like that? I hope I don't ever see you in Walmart like that because I'm going to make fun of you, and you'll, neck the me- you'll, you'll make the next sermon illustration. <laughs> Let me help you. Let me help everybody in here. Now, this, is, this is inspired, God-breathed preaching right here. Look, if the pants don't have a button, you can't wear them to Walmart, okay? If the pants don't have a button, you shouldn't wear them to Walmart. Now, you can wear them to Dollar General if you're getting two things. If you're only getting two things at Dollar General, you can wear pants with elastic sp- you know what I'm saying? Y'all understand what I'm talking about? Do y'all all wear your pajamas to Walmart? What's wrong with you people? <laughs> if it don't have a button, it's not proper for leaving the house and going to a store. Unless it's Dollar General for two things. <laughs> y'all are messing up this illustration. <laughs> Hush. Like it fastens like a, like a pair of blue jeans? That ain't pajamas. That's weird. Anyway, y'all have all seen the weirdos at Walmart that look like they just crawled out of the, a sleeping bag. Yeah, that's, that's what happened, yeah. I messed up. Figured y'all had a little more dignity than that. Next time, have more dignity than that. All right, if you're guilty of wearing your PJs to Walmart, the sermon's for you. The altar's right here. Miss Leslie will come play the piano in a minute, and we'll all come and pray over you so you, God will forgive you for wearing your PJs to Waffle House and to Home Depot and to Walmart and to the bank. There's a man I see almost every week in the bank, and he's got on pajamas. I'm like, fella, what's wrong with you? This is a bank. Anyway, 
I'm ranting. But when you see somebody at, a, at an establishment, other than our general, I'm getting more than two things. When you see somebody that's in their pajamas, they are not ready to go where they're at. They are not prepared. They have made no intentional preparation to go where they're going. They've made no intentional preparation. They are not ready. They have not had a bath. Aaron was told you got to wash your flesh with water. God told Aaron, go get a shower before you come in here. Before you come talk to me and, and want communion and fellowship and forgiveness from me, go get a shower. Go get clean. And then put on these specific linen garments that I have provided for you that are holy and set apart. They're separated. They're specific. They're not just what you wear to the mall or what you wear outside. They're not what you go hunting in. They're not what you wear to, uh, to go work in the backyard. These are specific, holy, sacred garments. When you coming in here to talk to me, you take a blessed fire shower and you get your clothes on, the white clothes, and you come in here and take this thing serious. He had to put his clothes on. Let me tell you something. We're not going to do our best prayers in our pajamas. We're not going to get right with God if we haven't made some intentional preparation. We're not going to just roll to bed and like, oh, God, and then call fire down from heaven. You're not going to get right by accident. You're not going to get right with God just happenstance. You're not going to get right popping gum and skipping down the altar like nothing's wrong. People, we've got to take this thing serious. Getting right with God is a serious action. It is a serious, absolutely necessary action. And we must make some serious adjustments because I believe a lot of people that we try to get right with God, we try to come down to the altar and we don't know why things aren't working. I believe a lot of it's our approach. Our attire. The attire of our heart. The attire of our heart. Now, now some of you are probably thinking I was going to start preaching on what we were to church. And I think you ought to dress nice to come to church. I think that's important. I think it's a sign of respect. If you wear your PJs to Walmart, you have no respect for Walmart. Does that make sense? That's why you would, because it's just Walmart. Who cares, right? Well, why don't we, you wouldn't, would you come to church that way? No, why? Because you respect the place, right? I even get a little funny about like what we wear when working up here. And I understand like we blue work clothes and stuff like that. And that's fine. Well, we don't come up here in our pajamas to work. We don't come up here in flip-flops and tank tops, sleeveless shirts. and Why? Because we respect where we're at. We don't wear pajamas. We wear... Anyway, anyway. Aaron's attire. All right, and then this... Let me close. Let me close. Look at verse 5. Let's see Aaron's acknowledgement. Verse 5 through... 11, 11, verse 5 through 11, five different times, five different times. He shall take, y'all looking at verse 5? He shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goat for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And, and Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is, say the next two words, for himself and make an atonement for himself. Five different times, it says, for himself. Look at verse 11. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. This is a man that every day of the week, every day made a sacrifice and an offering for somebody else. He... Every day he offered up the blood of a ram or blood of a lamb or blood of a dove for the sin of somebody else and would bring their name before God and say, God, brother so-and-so, done it again. He's brought this offering to ask for forgiveness. Will you forgive brother so-and-so? But this time he's got to acknowledge, God, it's me. I'm bringing this blood for me. I'm the one that done it. I'm the one that sinned. I'm acknowledging that I am the guilty one. Yes, I'm the high priest. Yes, I'm the brother of Moses. Yes, I'm the one that you used in, in, in Egypt and worked all those great plagues. And, and yes, I was chosen and I was, I was chosen to give him the highest office in the land. But God, it's me. I've done it. I need forgiveness. This blood's for me. He had to acknowledge that thing. 
five times for himself. God doesn't, never uses any words loosely. If he said it, he said it on purpose and he meant to and he said it five times in just a few verses. Stressing the point, Aaron's making a sacrifice for himself. for Because Aaron needs to be right with God. Because if Aaron's not right with God, the rest of Leviticus doesn't mean anything. It's a moot point. He'll just kill him. And then he'll kill the next one. And then the next one. And then the next one. Nadab and Abihu aren't the last priests that got killed. Oh, Aaron even died later on. That's another book. That's another sermon. But he had to acknowledge it. Let me say this. and Miss Leslie, can you come on the piano? You're not going to get right with God until you look at you as guilty. Until you see that you are the problem, you're not going to get right with God. If you can't acknowledge your own guilt and your sin, you're not going to get right with God. It's just not going to happen. We need a revival of humility just so we can get right with God. Not so we can see 17,000 people saved in a few years. Not just so that we can see rock for the glory of God. Not so that we can start ministries and change lives. Not so that we can shake the world for Christ. We need a, a revival of humility just so that we can get right with God ourselves. Just so that we can come to an altar and talk to God and Him listen and not get irritated by our pride. We need a revival of humility so that we can acknowledge our own sin. Somebody help me. We get so focused on what we want to do for God and what we want to see God do in our town. And I'm all for praying for revival. And I'm all for seeing God change this town for His own glory. And I want to be a part of that. But that's not why we want to get right with God. That's not why we need humility. That's not why we need to acknowledge our own sin. If that's all we're after, then we don't care if we're right with God or not. All we want, all we want to do is use God's power. Use God's blood and use God's grace to build a kingdom. We're not, at, we're not building our own kingdom. If you're not in church to get right with God, you're in church for the wrong reason. I'm going to say that. If you're not in church to get right with God, you're in church for the wrong reason. Yes, brother, you can do a right thing for the wrong reason. Remember, Jeremiah said, the, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Your heart will tell you all sorts of crazy nonsense and make you think you're coming to church for the right reason. And if it ain't to get right with God, you're not doing it for the right reason. And if you can't acknowledge your own sin, you're not getting right with God. I can pray for you every day of the week, but if I don't pray for my own sin, I ain't right with God. You got to acknowledge your own sin. We got to get to a place where we can say, "All right, God, it was me. It was me." That confession. That confession. Intercession without confession. Don't do any good. Let's stand on our feet. Getting right with God.